All right, friends, thank you for coming today. Um, this is so exciting. We're so lucky to have um, authors who are willing to talk to us about their experience. I know so many people in the world think that they can write a book, and so many of them don't. I'm totally one of those people. And so um, I think just writing a book and getting it published is a gigantic accomplishment. Um, I like I can't even imagine. And I know that you all have like other things in your lives that you do every day. So um, I'm so interested to hear about your experiences. Everyone is so different. We were supposed to have four authors today. Danielle Bertoli, who um, wrote Struck Inside Out, um, couldn't be here today. I know that looks like a little bit like a memorial. She's fine. She's fine. <laughs> on it so if you're interested in learning more about her you can totally go to her website that's our library book so you can totally check it out with your library card from any Nassau County library if you have traveled from another place in Nassau County. Um, okay my name is Heather Massa I am a librarian here at the East Harper Library um, and maybe you would like to introduce yourself. Hi I'm Shanita good morning, good morning. Um, and I live in East Rockaway. <laughs> uh, Bill Brook also living in East Rockaway. Christy Strong, I used to live in East Rockland, <laughs> and now I'm in love down here. Great. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask some questions, and we're going to go through the panel, and um, they'll answer the questions, and then I'll ask them another question, and then they'll answer our other question. And then when we're done, if you have a question, you can certainly ask it. Don't call it the turkey. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we're going to start with Shanita. What inspired you to start writing? Um, so I have always been a writer. I was an English major in college. Writing has always been kind of a foundation of everything I've done, creatively or like for my business as a life coach. Um, but I didn't actually want to write a book. I, <laughs> in 2021, I had just had my third child. Um, the pandemic was still heavy. And I was really tired. I was going through like an identity crisis. Who am I? Motherhood is hard. And then, um, like I just have a very little image of her here. Her name is Durka and she's a warrior goddess. She holds like like deadly weapons in her hand. She rides a tiger. She's my metaphor for courage. And she was like, oh, you gonna write a book. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? Like, no, no thank you. Like I was like, one day I'll write a book, but like that day is not gonna be anytime soon. And she was like, no, you're gonna write a book and you're gonna write it now, go. And I was like, okay. And so, um, as my source of courage, she inspired me, she encouraged me and kind of pushed me to uh, to write this book, Dear Zorga. And I can, I can share more about that in a bit, but she was the inspiration for me to share my story. You know, I was on the Hot Mess Express as like a, as a mom trying to navigate motherhood, but I was also navigating like entrepreneurship because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And so just this sort of self-help memoir came together from my own life experience over the course of seven years. And so she was the one who pushed me to make that happen. <laughs> William, what inspired you to start writing? Well, I've always been a storyteller. Um, I had absolutely no interest in writing because writing is hard. Why would anyone want to do this, um, at least consistently? Um, it was actually a, um, a creative writing class I think it was in high school. I'm still trying to remember. I've been bandying back and forth. But I had written this story, and I can still remember the name of it. It was, uh, if you left no clues, you made no crime. It's the only thing I can remember about the entire story. <laughs> but I had submitted it to my teacher, and, and he came back to me afterwards and said, this was so good, I actually read it to my family. I'm like, uh, OK. Uh, I've never even thought of writing. And again, this is way too hard for me. So, and that was a ridiculous long time ago. Over time, I, I used to write a lot, just on and off. You know, I had a couple of stories that I had started early on from high school into college, and, and they were all absolutely horrible. Um, and then we were at uh, my niece's wedding, and the priest, just the way he presented everything, kind of gave me inspiration of the origin story of the main character, and that's what spurred this book. And that's how I went on from there. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a long journey of actually going in different places and finally deciding on, here's what I want to write and getting it out there. Okay. Christy, what inspired you to start writing? 
I think I was writing before I actually knew how to write. So I would create stories and scenarios for my Barbie dolls, of course, and put them in pretty ridiculous scenarios looking back for a five or six year olds and be like, here's a campsite and a murderer is coming. Or like, you're married and you have a terrible breakup. And let's go through that. So once I actually started write, uh, reading, Full, more full chapter books around seven, eight, nine, especially Harry Potter. I was like, oh my god, these books are, they're like teleportation devices into other worlds, and especially Harry Potter, the whole portal into another world. And I decided, I want to do that. I want to get these worlds out of my head and onto paper. And I started creatively writing, whether it was outside of school on my own or in school for projects. And it evolved a bit in middle school and high school where I started experience, uh, experimenting in poetry, uh, nonfiction writing, and kept creatively writing as well. And it was about around 23 years old where I can't remember exactly if the book idea came first or if I just was like, I want to write a book. That's it. By 30, I want to write a book. I want, that's it. That's going to happen. Um, and then the idea of balloon days kind of sprouted from that because it was at 23, this yearning for more and to do more, and it got me really excited. And over 10 years, it evolved from that little seed of an idea to what it is today. All right, great. So, Shamita, tell us what your book is about. Yeah. So my book. <laughs> <laughs> so my book. This is my first very, uh, my very first book. It's a self-help memoir. And it's a story about how I teamed up with Dorka, this warrior goddess, um, to uh, overcome a lot of deep-rooted fears and find fulfillment. And um, the reason why the word victorious is in here is because um, when we think of victory and victorious, right, we think of like winning and triumphant. But what's so interesting about the word is that by definition, it means to be fulfilled. Like, did you know that? I didn't know that. I was like, what? You know? So there is this deeper meaning. Like, because I was like the perfectionist, overachieving box checker, just trying to like be the model mom and employee entrepreneur, all the things. And then I realized that, that that's not what it's about. Like, forget the success and the benchmarks. Like, I want to feel victorious. Like at the end of every day, when I wake up or when I end my day, can I say to myself, wow, like I feel victorious, I feel fulfilled. And what does that look like? But because I was like swimming in lots of fear, I needed to call in my courage. And so Dorga, I wrote letters to her in my journal. I was like, dear Dorga, I don't know what I'm doing today. Hell, kids are crying. What am I gonna, I'm losing my mind. What am I gonna do? And so she would come through and she was my courage. She would give me courage and help me, you know, talk to me, coach me, you know, roll her eyes at me, you know, <laughs> stubborn sometimes. And um, the, the book takes you through this courage kit, the framework that I came up with as a coach to call in your courage and keep it alive, right? Because fear, it shows up all the time, everywhere, anytime, any place, any day. And so my courage is what helped me emerge victorious. And so, you know, I'm talking about my hobby, I'm sharing my stories, I'm going there, but I'm also walking readers through interactive exercises, really realistic things you can do in five minutes to really help you reset and nourish yourself and feel good. And I, and I even wrote a, a courage rap song. <laughs> do you want to hear my courage rap song? Of course you want to hear it. <laughs> I feel nervous. <laughs> I just talk over so I write a, a rap, I write a couple of raps in the book because I just wanted to make it interactive. Um, and this courage rap song opens up chapter one. Because to me, courage is so multidimensional and it's, it means a lot of things. Okay, <coughs> okay here I go. Uh, 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 courage is a feeling, revealing healing. It starts in your body and goes beyond the ceiling. Wisdom, be a spiritual system, one of a kind, made for humankind. Courage is a mindset that you won't forget. Pure alignment, pure refinement. 
It's a behavior that could be your savior, protecting you from all the straight danger. Courage is a practice when fish distract us. An unquad squad, God or no God. An attitude of magnitude, renewed by gratitude. You get your VIP access in solitude. Courage is love, 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 love. The kind of love that you'll never get sick of. It's a bear hug squeeze. Cozy full of ease, they don't charge fees. Can I get another round, please? <laughs> himself uh, he, when, when he was growing up his mother died at an early age he was supposed to get um, his first communion but never received it fast forward 20 years later uh, he goes to his cousin's wedding and when he he decides that he's gonna go up and, and get communion and then at that point it activates all of his supernatural powers that he didn't even know he had he, he, he ends up getting becoming part of this larger supernatural um, team that's been fighting uh, the Tainted, which is why it's the Tainted Wars, um, for, for since the beginning of time. So this was one of those things where he gets thrown into this, he, he has no idea what he's doing, he's got all these new powers that he doesn't know how to use because he's supposed to be training from an early age of like 10 or 11. And he just keeps finding himself trying to make sure that he's enough to be able to fix the issues that are popping up. And uh, it's a long battle process that he gets up and then finally, of course, there's victory, victory in the end. In the end, he's not victorious, right? Um, and that's kind of what that whole thing is. And it stems into now, how does this progress going forward? So kind of delves into religion and, and how it ties in across multiple religions that we all kind of have the same thoughts and feelings and align even though we have very different viewpoints from a religious standpoint or, or no religious standpoint. Um, so. Is it a planned trilogy or more than that? Uh, it's going to keep going until I figure out what the ending is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's very gratuitous. That's approach. it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Christy, tell us about um, Balloon Days. Yeah. Sure. So, Balloon Days uh, is about three different characters that find themselves at their the peak of their yearning and desperation for hope, for change, for something better than what's going on in their lives currently. So they find themselves at the center of Balloon Days, which is a Manhattan-based psychological treatment center, and it's a very controversial treatment because the Balloon Day sessions themselves have the ability to alter brain waves and then when you alter those brain waves you can go into almost like a lucid dream state and so the patients are allowed to essentially work through unconscious fears and desires consciously so they can create whatever they want and it feels as realistic as you being in this room right now when they go into that their day room and they have a balloon day session so they have to figure out though at some point are these balloon day sessions helpful or are they more harmful because what are you willing to risk and sacrifice of your real life challenges uh, in order to just keep trying to escape them so that's where there's themes of battling with morals with what's more important outside of life uh, that escapism that we can all want to turn to and how much escapism that turns to avoidance so by the end they all have their victory turn points, of course, <laughs> and battle, yeah, and actually come back to, well, maybe they come back to their real life challenges, I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> so at that point, though, hope does arise there, they find themselves a bit more, and I think we all struggle with that at different points in our lives, so it's very relatable, and I did, I did a pull off of my full-time job, which is being a mental health therapist, so that gave me a lot of insight on the human condition and the inner workings of how humans operate. Yeah. 
Um, just need that. And we'll start with you. Can you tell us what's your writing process look like? Like you could do like a day or a week or I don't know. I don't know if you do it every day or if it's something, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, because, because I was told by my courage that this is something I need to do now, it sort of kicked me into gear. Again, I was writing, I was writing articles or content for my own website, things like that, but it was like, oh, I gotta sit down, like, consistently and write and, like, not get distracted, and that was very difficult at, with, at the time, a six, a four, and a one-year-old, um, and Again, pandemic life, right? So we're still pretty homebound. And um, what helped me get started was writing a book proposal. You don't have to write a book proposal, but I was entering a contest. I was entering a writer's workshop contest where I was able to learn about publishing. And they were like, well, if you enter our contest, you can win a, a contract with the, with the publishing house. So I was like, okay, this contest will motivate me and give me the accountability I need, right? Like, I need that deadline. I need something to be like, all right. So writing that book proposal required me, you know, like a few hours a day, maybe five to six days a week to really figure out what am I doing, right? Like loose leaf paper, all my stuff, my journals, everything scattered on the ground, just figuring out how to, what am I even writing about? Because like, that's half the battle. Just trying to figure out what am I trying to say? Because you have so many stories, but you're trying to really distill, right? Like what's what's at the heart of what I'm trying to do here? Um, so the book proposal really helped me like create the blueprint to figure out what am I writing? Why is it important? Who am I writing to? And I created some sample chapters as well and breakdowns. So by the time I actually had to start writing, where I continued the manuscript, I took like three months off. So I was like, I don't wanna look at this Microsoft Word document anymore. Like I can't. <laughs> um, so taking breaks is very important, but when I came back to it, I was able to get into a flow. Because I knew what I was doing, because I had already began the process. I had an outline telling me in chapter two, you're gonna talk about all these things. So it was lucky for me, I wasn't able to get too lost in the sauce. And what, like two to three hours in the mornings when, when like my, I had a little bit of brain power um, and some coffee, I was able to write. At, at, sometimes I had to run away upstairs and write on the rocking chair upstairs because the kids were like making noise. And I just did that every day for like three hours a day for five to six days a week for, uh, I don't know, like seven, like nine months total between the book proposal and this. And yeah, that was my, my flow. Right, right, wow, all right. Yeah, but I don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do that. William, tell us about what's your writing process look like? My writing process, my alarm goes off at 5.30 in the morning and then I turn it off. <laughs> Eventually I'll get up. Uh, I usually start work at 7 a.m. Uh, three days a week I work from home, two days a week I go into the office. The days that I work from home, um, in my office, my home office, by 6 o'clock, that's the goal. Uh, and I get a, try and get a good solid hour in the writing ahead of time. I have no outlines. I have no idea what's going to happen next, as much as anyone else does. So. I just keep writing and whatever pops in my head is what gets onto the paper or onto the computer. Yeah, I can't. I, I outlined once and I got so lost afterwards. I'm, you know, I have a general idea sometimes. Uh, the third book that I'm working on now, I have no idea what the ending even looks like. I have no idea what direction I'm going in. I'm just like, if I keep going, eventually I'll, I'll hit there, right? Um, but then also on the, the days that I go into the office, I'll, I'll write on the train. So it's a lot of times that uh, at one point I, I went into the, the Facebook group and I took a picture of myself next to the restroom in the train, like, here's my writing office. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just, it's that constant, the idea of getting at least 200 page, 200 words a day down, just to keep that process going. Sometimes I'll get more, sometimes I'll hit a thousand words, sometimes I'll hit like 199 and I'll just write, oh good, I'm got 200 <laughs> um, But that's, that's. Stephen King writes 12 pages to Three hundred sixty-five days a year, even on Christmas. Twelve pages a day. Can you believe it? Because he had no other job. He has no other job, <laughs> and he has plenty of money. Plenty of money. He never has everybody. I think it's Jackie Collins who writes a book every six months or something ridiculous. She just like pumps out a lot. Or they have six. Yeah, it's like one of those. Chrissy, tell us about what your writing process looks like. So, okay, so if you ask me when I was writing. 
it was so that momentum was pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah. If I finally around 20, no, like 30 actually years old. When, so I wanted to write the book by 30, right? I picked it up, put it down throughout my 20s, and I just like wasn't clicking yet. And then finally around 30 years old in 2018, I hired an editor, and that helped, like you said, the deadline helped so much that I booked weekends to get away and just write hours on end. Um, and I would take my little dog, and the only thing I did was take her out for a walk, eat, and write. That was it. So, and then I would write between clients, if clients canceled, get right to writing, um, after work, right? So it was like, once I had that going, I was excited about it. There was something to actually work with now and mold and edit, revise, work with the editor, bounce ideas off of. And it didn't feel so lonely. Either. Right, someone else was invested. Yeah, in so sure. it was it was really nice, and it continued that way until it was in its more you know in the best shape it could be, and I was really proud of it. So I was right. That was it. Final draft done. Um, final draft was probably two hundred drafts later. So honestly, the first draft is despicable. Like it's so <laughs> disjointed mess. Uh, it's just like there's characters that I cut. There, it's just. Yeah, it's not good. I wouldn't want anyone to read that. <laughs> I don't even want to. Read. Um, so nowadays, marketing is more of the priority, which is very difficult. It's a whole other ball game, and I actually would much rather be writing than marketing. So otherwise, I do try to. I don't have a word count per day, but I try to write something, even if it's in my phone notes app and it's a title idea or. Sometimes I'll write dialogue lines that pop up with no scene context at all, but I'm like, maybe I can turn that into a scene later on. Uh, plot ideas, and then I am working on another book that I was telling you, it's on a standstill around 20,000 words, so I have to go back into that, but sometimes I creep in and I'm like, oh no, I don't, I, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> like, I want to I redirect it, and that's overwhelming, but I think if you, if you just, I remind myself, you just gotta get words down. Like, exercising that muscle and don't lose that flow in some way. Great, great. Okay, um, so Shanita, you had talked a little bit about um, doing the book proposal for the book contest. How did you get published? Was that the, was that the beginning part of it? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> that book proposal felt like like a master's thesis. It was it was like it was just a lot. It was like I gotta I gotta <coughs> prove to people like all of these things, you know. I was just like because I just kinda wanted to write. I was like, I just wanna be in flow, I just wanna see what's gonna happen. And, and I, I get it, you know, because um, it was Hay House, the um, they, they do a lot of like spiritual self-help. And so Hay House was uh, hosting this contest and that sort of forced me to get a little bit more organized than I would have liked. Um, but the the grand prize winner um, got a Hay House contract, and the runner-up prizes got a uh, publishing contract with Balboa Press, which is their self-publishing arm. So I won the runner-up prize, and that's how I ended up with Balboa Press. And like, I'm gonna keep it all the way real. Like, there there are some times where I so wish that I just had more control because even though they were the ones to physically get the manuscript published and distributed, I didn't like like even simple things like your Amazon author page things like that like I didn't really have a ton of control because they were like the, the middleman that I had to keep going through they they published my book without telling me so I submitted my corrections at like 4 p.m. on January 25th and the thing went off the thing went online and I had no idea so a friend client of mine is like hey I bought your book and I'm like for real you like bought my, where's your book I don't know what my book is and so it, it, there were some things like that that just made me go, man, like this is really like throwing me off in terms of like my book marketing preparation and game. But all of that to say, they were helpful in putting the pieces together so that it could go out into the ethers, you know, um, in ebook and um, soft cover and hardcover format. And then I just took the reins and did an audiobook afterwards. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, what, um, what was your publishing process? Well, I self-published, and that was after uh, a long debate I had with myself on whether I wanted to try to go through traditional publishing or, or do it myself. And I ultimately decided to self-publish because I wanted full control. 
Plus, I wanted the 70% gratuities, the, the royalties, instead of the 20 to 30% that you get from a traditional publisher. I wanted to be able to control all aspects of it. So what it means for those who, who don't understand self-publishing or um, indie publishing, yes. which is the, the term like we use now, is it basically means that I have to do everything myself. I have to go out and I have to hire editors to, to review it. I have to make sure that they're actually giving me back good feedback as opposed to just telling me what I want to hear. It's like, no, 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 you need to tell me what's wrong with this so we can fix it. Um, I need to align with Amazon and, and align with a publisher, um, a, a, print, a printer, which is even Spark I use to do most of the printing. Um, I created, I, what's that? Cover art. Cover, cover art was, I did all of my own cover art between myself and my, my son and my daughter and my wife. They all uh, gave me their insights and, and suggestions. Um, it's, uh, the, even the, the poster that I have there, I, I created myself. I built my own website. Um, I actually had to go out and learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript just to be able to build my own website because I, well, one, I didn't want to spend any money on it, so. And I wanted, again, full control and I wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do with it, so. Uh, do I recommend it? Probably not, but it, it's, it's the process that, that I felt most comfortable with and gave me, I, I didn't want to hand over my rights because that's what you do when you go traditional publishing you're handing over the rights to that book and they will publish it how they see. They will take your input, they will, you know, you get to make all the corrections and make sure that it's the type of book that's inside has to be, but they will generally decide what the cover looks like, they will decide where it goes, they will decide how much funding they're going to put into the marketing, and I didn't like any of those answers, so. Um, will I do it one day? Yes, I think one day I will do it just to be able to say, yes, someone else published my book and they felt worthy enough that I, that, you know, so I, I get that extra victory. But, um, you know, I, I, I really wanted full control, so. Okay, all right. Christy, what did your publishing process look like? Uh, back in, I think it was 2020, I started sending out uh, query letters to agents and publishers, which are essentially our emails trying to you know, put your book in the best lighting that you can and tell that agent why you want that agent to represent you. And then you, you wait. I did that over about six months period. I had an Excel spreadsheet of who I sent it to, when I sent it to them, and then if they responded, what they said. Um, some of them don't respond at all. Some of them do, and they give you a little bit of a, you know, the cookie cutter, like we just were representing a lot of books, we can't take it. Some of them give a little bit more personalized. A lot did say, um, I love the premise, it's very unique. However, I don't feel strongly enough to champion. That was like a big one, a lot of them to champion it. Like, okay. One of the cool ones though that I took a chance on was Mel Parker, who is James Patterson's agent. And even though he obviously does like the crime and mystery and stuff, which is not this at all, but he did, he was putting that, he was looking for some uh, out market fiction or things a little bit outside of what he normally does and he did respond and I was so excited and he asked for three chapters it was actually three chapters that are not the first three chapters anymore so I'm like oh, maybe you would have taken it <laughs> but he was like ultimately it's not the fit for him but good luck that kind of thing so I was just really excited that he even answered I thought that was cool um, and then I also I joined Facebook groups and one of them was for female writers and I you know, put the idea out there, the blurb, and an editor, it caught an editor's attention, and she messaged me and was like, I love, you know, how your book sounds, I want to read it, please send me the manuscript. And then she worked for a traditional publisher, but it's more of a small publishing um, house, so she read it within two days, wrote back that she was obsessed, loved it, she sent a voice memo to him, she's like, this has to be out, I want this, I'm going to lift this up. She sent it to the owner of the uh, publishing house, which is Pennant Publications, and within, I think, a week or two, I had a book contract to look over and sign. And I did get very lucky. They're so flexible because they're a smaller house. So like, so my brother actually designed this book cover, and they were on board with it, and there's, I love that, that he, there's a more personalized piece to it. And they 
uh, offer 50% royalties, which is more than usual, so that was nice, yeah. And they just, they give a lot of flexibility, like I can write my own author page, my Goodreads, they want you and they encourage you to do social media and that you have to maintain a website and keep it active. Um, but they're, they've been very easy to work with. And at the same time though, there's been some things I had to catch because they're a little smaller, so they're not, they don't have like the elite editors and the best things, so I'd be like, how did they miss such a, no period. <laughs> <laughs> so there's still like something that I realized the other day and I was like, that's, that's an amateur being in. <laughs> Hopefully, whatever. I, I actually read Colleen Hoover and Frida um, McFadden, McFadden, and they had errors, and I was like, Oh yeah, he's when you're done. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's basically how it came to be about the marketing too is not super strong with them because again it's smaller and they have a lot of authors that they're working with. So there's some pros and cons to it. So it's a little bit almost like some self-publishing feel with the flexibility and then the security of like they are putting it out. Uh, they formatted it, they pay, you know, they do the Abram Sparks, they get it on Amazon, or Barnes Noble, all, 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 Kobo, all that. So, yeah. Okay. Um, this is because we're talking about self-publishing. There was one thing I wanted to offer about that. I think, like, if you Google anything about self-publishing, it's like, you can do it. It's free, and it's, mm -hmm. it's accessible, and you, anyone can go on Amazon and go, I have something, upload it, and done, it's published, but, like, it's not free. Like, you know, <laughs> like, was, you have to, like, I, I still had to pay for my own editing services for the book proposal and for the book itself. I paid for my cover, my cover illustration, and, like, I still had to, even though I won this $10,000 grant, I still had to shell out my own money, thousands of dollars, to you know get all these other pieces in place that one they weren't going to provide. But two, like you, you just need you need these things if you're going to put out something quality, you know, out into the world. And so there's just so much. There are these other like pieces that you have to think about if you are going to write a book. Like you have to have some kind of budget. You got to yeah. have okay. something. It don't need to be a lot, but you need to have something. Um, to to know that here's an investment that I'm willing to make on this project. Yes, exactly. Even if you are querying or trying to get a traditional publisher, you need to make sure it's in the best shape mm -hmm. you think it can be at that point to provide them. So especially with fiction books, nonfiction is a little bit different where you can give a proposal sometimes. Um, but then at that point, you don't have an editor yet. So I did invest like in a writing coach and a few editors, and yeah, it does definitely add up. But at least it makes it more and more something that you're happy about. And I think that's really important. Right. A writing coach, what kinds of, are, so they read your stuff and then you get a, you can bounce ideas off yeah. them? Just like another person who understands what's she, going on? Yeah, she, uh, she worked with uh, Celeste. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Aim, okay. Um, so she was a little bit pricey, but I found her really worth that she actually read it and she did more of a content editing and she gave a lot of great advice of what readers want and told me to merge certain characters, cut certain storylines, enhance and live to make it a little bit more clear of what the mechanism behind the Balloon Days was, like push it further. So she really went through each like line by line and at content edited, which is different from copy editing, which is more grammar. Just because content is like, does the arc make sense? Are these characters layered? Yeah, does this need to be in here? So that that helps so much, though, and I, I am glad I did that. That's so interesting. I wouldn't have known that there was a job. Yeah, yeah. Know. Because I always think of editors. I don't even know how I found it. But editors, like, in big, big publishing houses would do that mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. But um, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I asked, if you guys had something to recommend besides your books um, to our gatherers, esteemed audience, <laughs> um, that you think is worth their time to either read or watch or listen to? Yeah. Um, you know, when you're learning about like the publishing world, it's like you got to get a whole degree in that because it's like it's just so much information um, to know the lay of the land. And so, you know, you can Google articles, but there's a million things out there. So one podcast that was very helpful to me was, I think it's called Kindlepreneur. 
the, if you Google Kindle, Kindlepreneur, there's a website that this guy named Dave Chesson started, and he has self-published all his stuff on Amazon, and he basically walks new authors through like how do you how do you how do you go from A to Z, and especially the book marketing piece, which there's so many ways that you can slice and dice it. And so the website was very helpful because he writes blog articles on all the different pieces, fiction, nonfiction, audiobook, this, that, and the third. But the podcast was really helpful because then you get to hear from other authors who have self-published, how did they do it? You know, what what did they test out? Did they run Amazon ads? Did they, like, there's all there's a whole world of this stuff. So it's just helpful to like hear, and they're very quick. They're like no more than like 15 minutes an episode. So I'd be like making dinner, and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna yeah. work this. Yeah. You know, like I just one thing every day. Yeah, to try to one little thing every it day because it, it can be very overwhelming. But I think the idea of like hearing from other authors in person is is that's always been a helpful way for me to learn about the industry. Awesome. So I'll give a I'll give a couple of suggestions um, <laughs> on the same vein as uh, uh, podcasting. So. The one podcast I started listening to early on was Writing Excuses. Yes, I love that. Brandon Sanderson <laughs> and, and several other who I can't remember now. Um, yes, and then, yeah, their, their tagline was 15 minutes long because you're in a hurry and we're not that smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it gave, like, they, they go into the, the methods of writing, the theories behind it, and, you know, the, the, the five. No, the uh, five acts. Oh, uh, yes. Five oh, yeah, act yeah, yeah. versus seven act versus three act. Versus, yep. Syntax. So they go yeah. deep into that. Um, from there, I, I jumped into the bestseller experiment. So these are a couple of uh, people who their goal was to write a book in one year and have it published, mm -hmm. right, self published, which they did. And but, um, very successful writing uh, duo. The, the one, there, there are two marks in it. One mark is uh, Mark Stay. He's the one who wrote the blurb on my, for my book. Uh, he recently wrote a movie that just came out recently, Unwelcome. So go see that, it's, it's kind of weird. But <laughs> um, from a book standpoint, I'm gonna recommend his books, which are uh, The Witches of Woodville. So I think he's got three out there now. There's a fourth one coming. They've just been published in in the US, they were based in the UK. Uh, it's about, about a, a teenage witch or a witch coming to coming of age from within the World War II oh. timeline. So very, very cool. Awesome. Hey, Christine, do you have something to recommend? I'll recommend a fiction book that was not necessarily inspiration, but was uh, something that did help a little bit in my writing journey. It's called uh, The Midnight Library by Matt Hay. So it's got elements of magical realism also, and the main character, she finds herself in this, uh, kind of similar to my characters, this place of just desperation and wanting more and feeling like she can't have that, and she's very hopeless. She finds herself in what they call the Midnight Library, and it's, kind, it's almost like her limbo state between Earth and the afterlife, and she, picks up a book and each book has an alternate version of her life if she had made different choices at certain points. Yeah, so it's it's about that having that regret, seeing what could have played out, and again, I won't spoil the ending to tell you what she wound up doing, um, but it was really interesting to live all those lives too with her. So it's, a, it's really a cool book. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so our last question is, was there anything about writing a book, becoming an author, becoming a published author, I should say, um, or the process of writing that surprised you in a good or a bad way? Um, I think for Dear Georgia, this was a very personal, transformational experience for me. Um, there is this component of like spirituality meets reality in the book, and that that was something I was like, you know, I had to like excavate seven years of my life. Like, you know, that was very like, ooh. Like, I had to really go there and I think writing my stories and sharing them, many of them for the first time was like just healing for me. And so um, it was just like a personally rewarding experience for me. But 
writing the book is like, it's a whole feat in itself. And then once you're done, you're so tired, you're like, oh, now I gotta market this book. I remember <laughs> like, when we, we walked in, I was like, that's a full-time job, you know? Nobody, you know, unless you have this like engine underneath you and a whole marketing team, you know, and nothing else to do in your life, you could just go, go, go and be out there. Like, I have three kids, I have a business, I have a lot going on, and so, I think I've had to like practice a lot of acceptance. Like, Shanita, this is all you're gonna do today or this week or this month. And you reached out to one person, okay, good. You know, like just pacing myself because I think when we see like celebrities, especially like come out with books, they're everywhere, they're on TV. You know, that's because they're paying like a PR person 10K a month to get them these, you know, spots on Good Morning America, right? So I can't be mad at myself. And I'm like, I'm not on GMA yet when like, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like making rice in the kitchen for my kids, you know, I'm like, all right, well, here I am, I published a book, but I still got things to do every day, you know, like, this is not glamorous, and so they make it seem glamorous, and I know I fell for it, I was like, oh, it's so cool, and like, they're everywhere, and I'm toxic, like, that, it, it can happen, but like, everything is a cost, right, okay, how much, it's a pay-to-play game when, when you're book marketing. So, right, even running ads, like you can have your book on Amazon, it's like, well, ain't nobody gonna see it unless right, that algorithm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. right, unless that algorithm is like on your side, right, or you're running an ad, yeah, or there's yeah. that one person. So I think I had this like fallacy that like, maybe this book will like be my big break. And, Cause I've been like at this curve work for going on eight years, you know, so it's been a marathon for me, but I think, I'm just being very patient and I'm, I'm listening to Dorka who's like, I got you, don't worry, like you're not on the wrong path. And I'm like, okay. So, you know, I think I'm kind of like trying to walk my own talk from my <laughs> book right now to get me through this like second leg of the journey of like, what is it like after publishing? Right, right. That, yeah. You said that was the hardest part and it wasn't. Yeah, like writing the book felt like easy breezy compared to like yeah. all of the marketing stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, we'll have an Instagram uh, marketing this summer. That'll be one. A special one. Uh, William, what surprised you? Was there anything that surprised you so far? Mm -hmm. the, the amount of work that needs to get done after you write the end. I, you know, I, I, I got, I, 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 rem I remember it vividly. I was in the backyard, I was finishing up. I wrote the end and I was all excited and I'm like, great. And the amount of work I had to do to get from that point to the finished book, that was ridiculous. Oh my God. It, it was, you know, I, I, first of all, the, the first book I started, I wrote it in third person viewpoint. When I had my first editor go through it, they're like, you obviously want this written in first person, just write it in first person. So I had to rewrite the entire thing in a first person viewpoint. Like you said, characters just came in and out or changed completely. It, it's it's amazing, you, you think that I write the end, I'm done. No, you're just beginning. So. Okay. It's like that little conspiracy theory board. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 It's all over. Um, Christy, was there anything that surprised you? Yeah, I will give a pleasant surprise. Um, I start, When I started writing, I realized uh, I don't have any idea to how to really write a novel that's gonna be at least 70,000 words. Like this isn't, like I was at 10, years old where I wrote a three page <laughs> book about, <laughs> about the vampires next door. <laughs> it's actually not that bad. Um, so I had to learn the craft and I bought a lot of books on how to write about Stephen King's book, um, Bird by Bird, books on syntax, books on how to uh, tell a, a story that has an arc and that's interesting language, I, wrote, I bought books on emotionally evoking words, um, sentence structure, rhythm, tone, voice. So it was exciting and I, I really loved that part of learning the behind the scenes and the techniques of writing a book. And then I was able to apply it in every revision, like every round of revision when I learned more or read an, even another fiction book, would bring it in and go and tweak and make things better. So it was, it was interesting to learn that you're the conductor and every instrument in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, my friends, that is all the questions I have for you. We have um, two more hours, just about. Um,
We are going to invite our authors to be, they have tables and you can buy copies of their books or talk with them about other things, whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, Danielle, who couldn't be here, I did have um, her website there. I just wanted to thank you guys for coming. Um, this was very interesting. I love writing. My undergrad degree is in writing and, you know, not lucrative, but uh, you know, I got into the libraries. <laughs> um, but I think, I mean, writing a book is the biggest deal. I mean, I think it's, it seems like um, you have accomplished such a giant thing. And I hope to see, oh, do you guys want to talk about what's next? Have you, have you decided? Does anybody want to, is anybody working on another thing? I know that you're working on your next book yep. in your series. I don't want to call it Chunzu because who knows how long it is. I'm, I'm hoping I uh, do like Lee Child and just keep going. Keep going, yeah, yeah. Oh, that guy just keeps going all around the, all around I don't, the I don't plan on killing him off anytime soon. <laughs> right, so. right. Um, if you guys are interested in writing, I did um, pull some books from our collection that you're welcome to take out. Um, and uh, thank you so much for coming. Yeah.